our financial acumen podcast topic for day for today is how to best prepare your company for sale. It's one of the most important events in a business life cycle and for stakeholders. So I'm very excited to introduce John Cable, founding managing partner at Hidden Harbor Capital Partners, a PE firm, who will share his wisdom and help us answer this question. John chairs the investment committee for Hidden Harbor and sets the overall strategic direction for the firm. He has over 20 years of private equity investment and operational experience, driving complex business turnarounds and producing top tier investment returns. Prior to founding Hidden Harbor, John served as a partner at Convest Partners, where he was a leader in the firm's equity fund and a member of the executive committee. Prior to Convest, John was an investment professional with HIG Capital. John started his career as a strategy consultant at Bain and Company, where he led strategy engagements for various Fortune 500 companies and due diligence assignments for some of the largest private equity funds in both the United States and Europe. John holds a BA in economics from Stanford University and an MBA from Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. John, I am so thrilled. Wow, what a resume, man. This is great. From the best, right? <laughs> from the best. I'm going to learn a lot here, as will our audience. So, John, let's start from the end. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to rewind this to the beginning. What is the one thing you'd like people who are preparing for a sale to take away from this session? I mean, I think there's actually a lot you can do as an entrepreneur in the last years you're preparing for a sale that can drive a ton of value for you. And so this is the first time you're going to ever go through the sale process, likely. And there's a bunch of counterintuitive things you probably haven't thought through. And then in some ways, they're going to be like counter to what's made you so successful as an entrepreneur that you need to do in a sale process. And I'm hoping we focus on, on some of those because I think some of them are not intuitive if you haven't been through this, but are actually pretty simple things that every entrepreneur can execute on. Let's hit on those. John, why not? Let's do it now. I mean, this this, sure, this sure. time like, like right now. Let's do it. So, so like the, the most important thing to think of in a sale process is, 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 is the, the power dynamic that's going to happen during it. So what you're going to do is you're going to go out, you're going to get some information together, you're going to send it out to a reasonably large sum of investors. They're going to look at it. Some will be interested, some won't. They'll put in some indications of interest. You'll have management meetings. They'll do extensive due diligence. It's this whole process. And from the start to the finish, the way this works, there's a couple of things. The most important thing you need to understand is that the power of the seller goes down through the process and the power of the buyer goes up. And the reason is you start with 100 buyers, right? And so at that point, you know, the buyers are still trying to say, hey, choose me. My value is the right value, et cetera. The, the, the further you go through this process, the lower sort of the less leverage you have as the seller and the more leverage the buyer has. And the most leverage the buyer is going to have is going to be at the end when it's just that person doing that detailed diligence, right? And then they have the ability to say, hey, you didn't tell me this, you didn't do that. I'm going to lower the price and you're faced with, well, if I want to sell the business, I need to take that. So, 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 so just understand that power dynamic goes down over time. There's two things that means you need to do. One, the time you spend selling your business, the value is going down every day. One, because it's way too much work and you're going to be distracted. And I've, I've never seen a business get better during a sale process. They don't because the management team is way too distracted. But more important, the power dynamic goes down during that whole thing. And so when I go to sell businesses and I sell businesses for a living, everything is about trying to shorten that time frame. Yep. And the way you do that is you prepare, you prepare, you prepare. You go, you figure out all the questions you're gonna ask, you have a detailed data room ready. And when, when a buyer asks you a question, they say, yep, it's right here, when can you close? Yep, it's right here, when can you close? And so we're, we're actually in the market this week with one of our companies. We have spent about six months getting ready. And that's, and, and we, we do this for a living, right? So our businesses were probably way more ready because we always knew we were going to sell them than, than the typical entrepreneur. And I have a big team doing this. So it should just give you a sense of how much preparation we put into it. All of that preparation is meant to shorten that time frame 
and have as efficient a process as we can. And that's worth a lot of money. That's point number one. Point number two is um, as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur, and I know this because I started my own firm seven or eight years ago, at some level, you fake it till you make it, right? You, you, you always are putting the positive spin on things. You're not telling people the issues. You know, you, that's what you're doing. And, and that's the way all entrepreneurs are, because that's what it takes to start and maintain a business, particularly at the beginning when, when you don't have a lot of resources. In this sale process, it's going to be exactly the opposite. You need to tell buyers all the negatives up front. If, if, if you have some element of your business, let's say you have a lawsuit out there or you've lost a customer or whatever it is, if you tell buyers about it up front and position it the right way, it usually won't hurt you at all. Or, or at least it'll hurt you a little bit and you're gonna, it's going to hurt you as little as it humanly can. If you don't tell buyers about it and they find out about it later, and they are going to almost all find out about it. Just to be clear, we're good at this. We'll all find out about it. You have much less leverage. I'm going to put the very worst point of view on that because you didn't tell me about it. So every every ounce of you is going to say, "Well, I'm going to sell. I'm going to you know I'm going to put the best foot forward." When actually you need to put your worst foot forward at some level. You need to sell too, but you need to tell people all of those things up front where you can position them the right way when you have all the power and the power dynamic in your advantage. Those are my two biggest pieces of advice. Get prepared and tell everyone everything up front to the extent you can. Br brilliant advice, John. And as you mentioned, it's counterintuitive. It, to your entrepreneur who's the visionary who wants to put the sales foot forward. So how do you shift the mindset? How do you shift the mindset to, you know, let's put it all out there, you know, negative, positive, whatever. And, and, you know, that should be a, a natural starting point in the process. How do you get them there, John? So, so, let, so, so that, then let's think about this process, right? So I, I tell all people selling their business this. Let's say, let's pretend I'm buying your business and you're selling. I've bought well over 100 businesses at my time. So I, I've done this a bunch of times. This will be the first time you sell your business. And, and so if it's just me versus you, you have no chance. I mean, just no matter how good a business person you are, no matter how smart you are, like there's a whole series of these counterintuitive things and you won't have thought through any of them and you're going to get killed. So you need to get good advice. You need to go hire a good law firm, a good accounting firm. You need to have good advice. Point number one. Point number two, these people are ridiculously expensive. In your real world, they're really expensive. I spend, I'm about to, I'm about to sell a business I'm going to spend multi-million dollars in fees to sell this business. These people are really expensive, and you're going to be totally offended by how, how expensive they are. But you need to hire them. Your local lawyer who has gotten you through you know, lease contracts and maybe even a lawsuit is not going to work and, and, and is not going to run a good process. You need a good M&A attorney. People can recommend one. You need a good investment banker. You need a good accounting firm. So point number one is hire them. Point number two is they're going to be wildly expensive. Don't like sure manage their costs, but you're not going to really be able to just suck it up and know they're going to be expensive. And then three, actually listen to them. I'm amazed by the number of people that actually make it through point one and point two and then don't listen to them. Like these people are actually good at what they do. They've been through this process a hundred times and they're going to tell you to do some of these counterintuitive things and, and listen to them, please. And so, and by the way, as a buyer, I like that. I'd rather have a smooth process. I'd actually rather you have a good law firm. It, it actually makes my life easier because I'm not looking to win on like the legal points. I just want a market deal. And when you hire your local guy, it just, it takes so much longer, which by the way, is going to cost you money. They don't even understand the key issues to be negotiating. It's, it's a mess. And so the, the way to get in that right mindset is hire the right advisors, they're going to cost a lot of money and then actually listen to them and get prepared. Great point. So, so John, in, in my, in my uh, experience, uh, you know, you tell the entrepreneurs and the small to mid-sized firms, it's going to cost a lot of money. And, you know, when you're going through Q of E or audit preparation or all that kind of good stuff, um, and they start to kind of see the bills rack up, uh, you kind of see, you know, the stress and the heart attacks about to happen, right? In, in your experience, 
and you know share what you can on this one the range sure. of companies and we can kind of look at revenue just give a context that you know up to 50 million or maybe up to 100 million you would expect a range of x amount in fees because i've always had a sticky point in that when i've helped companies usher them you know through an exit process it's always been a sticky point tell us tell us what your experience has been in terms of range of fees and what to expect so you're talking about total fees, investment banker plus lawyer plus accountant. Yeah, or, or, or even you, you know, you 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 could combine them, or you can kind of do the, the lawyer and the accountant fee because that's where look when people sign up with the investment bankers, they they kind of know what they're getting, right? And they yeah. they take that. It's when this other stuff starts to rack up, all right, and it starts to rack up over time, and you know, entrepreneurs typically don't know what these experts are really doing. Just, just give a perspective, just a range that you yeah. expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the banker will charge you sort of 1% to 3%, sort of yeah. depending. Um, lots of them will ask for a um, retainer, which I think for a founder seller is probably a reasonable thing for them to be asking for. Yeah. You know, once again, this depends on the size. Let's say you're going to sell your business for $50 million plus or minus. Um, the lawyers uh, will cost you hundreds of thousands. Um, easy. Uh, more of that expense should be on the back end, but you want to, you know, you want to get the data request list, get them ready, all that kind of stuff. But but you could easily spend three, four, five hundred thousand dollars on lawyers, accountants. You know, you probably, you know, I'd, I'd recommend you get audited. You know, entrepreneurs have no need to be audited, right? Like they, it's just their money getting audited. There's no real reason for it. But when you go into a sale process, getting having one having audited financial statements means you're going to have to have the kind of discipline you need to have anyway, and those kind of controls your financials. But two, you should probably both get audited and get a quality of earnings. The two of those things put together for a fifty million dollar sale will probably cost you another couple hundred grand. Interesting, lovely. So you know, so yeah, it's going to end up being like three, four, five percent of the sale price, which yeah. is crazy, I know. But 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 like when I go to sell things, I do all those things. Like I'm somebody that sells businesses all the time as an expert. And that's what that's what we do. Because at the end of the day, it's absolutely worth it to run the right process. So entrepreneurs and founders listening to the show, brace yourself. Brace yourself. Well, and, and we can get into, you know, their ad backs and stuff like that. But for right now, there is a cash a significant cash component in this as you're kind of going through this process of, of an exit. That's right. And so that means, you know, you have to be ready. You have to have decided you really want to sell. And, and that doesn't mean you're going to just take any price you get. But, but I, you know, it, once you've decided to sell, you got to realize it is going to cost you a, a fair amount of money. And I get it, right? Like you're going to pay these people more than you've ever paid any professional services people in your life. And you've spent your whole business career controlling these costs because they're just dollars out the door, which is smart. In this case, these are dollars well spent. Got it. Fantastic. Okay. So in terms of preparation, you know, prepare, prepare, prepare to, to your point. You know, what's a, a reasonable period in advance to start preparing? If you know you're going to sell a business, what's the kind of lead time would you say to give yourself? I mean, you mentioned obviously data room and, you know, preparing financials and so forth, what would you say is a reasonable, just to get people thinking about, it's going to take this amount of time? Um, so I, so so if you want to give me the right long-term answer, the answer is like three to five years, right? Yeah. So when we buy a business, we are talking to the investment bankers in that, the, the traffic in those kind of businesses, like from the first day we buy it. And we have a clear idea of exactly what buyers are looking for. And we literally run our business to then generate the kind of business that a buyer wants to buy, which I know sounds crazy because entrepreneurs are all, they get it. Like, hey, if my business makes more money, you know, I'm going to get paid more for it. But it's both what the EBITDA is, but then what the multiple is. Yes. And how you run your business will actually, will actually drive sort of what that multiple is, you know? So it's, Hey, how recurring is your revenue? What segments are you in? There's a whole series of things you can do to your business actually to make it worth more money other than just drive higher to that. So I would suggest to owners that one day want to sell their business, they should be talking to investment bankers years before. Now, you don't have to like have a pitch 
and choose one or all those kinds of things. But a, a lunch here and there, asking them questions, all those kind of things. I'd encourage them to do that early, three to five years ahead of time. Be talking to your law firm. You know, if you're if, the, if you're the big law firm, you know, talk to them. But start to meet some M and A attorneys. You know, really talk to your accounting firm, who can often help you set you up with these folks because they will know the right ones. I would like literally three to five years in advance, just so you can start to get your brain around it. You have to make those solid decisions, but you're starting to think. I'd then say probably six to twelve months before you really want to start the process, not close the deal, start the process, you should be going out there, you should be picking your team, you should be start to understanding, you know, what you need to put in place. You're going to have a whole series of things you're going to need to pull together. Because once again, you want to shorten the time frame. So you want to have everything ready for buyers. So, you know, and this happens all the time, particularly with entrepreneurs, they're not ready, they don't have everything, I send them a data request list, most of the stuff doesn't come back. It just stretches out the time. And in that time, your business is getting worse and your leverage is going down. So it should literally be six to 12 months to really start formal preparations, three to five years to start thinking about it. Awesome. Awesome. So I, I love that the T minus 36 months, maybe T minus 24 and, and, and your ramp to the actual sales process. So let's let's take the outside time frame the t minus 36 so and let's go a thousand feet and then we're going to go all the way down right right john in, into into the process and what you look for so how do you evaluate a company's readiness for sale in terms of financials their operations and market positioning and we, we'll stay at a thousand feet and as i say we'll drill down a little bit well so uh how do i evaluate the readiness for sale yes. i mean look the business is the business Yep. And so and so either it's growing or it's shrinking, either it has good margins or bad, either those margins are expanding or they're contracting. It has a certain level of capital intensity. I mean, you know, it has either recurring revenue or non-recurring revenue. It's either a market leader or it's a trailer. So there's all these things that we're, is it in a growing market or is it a stagnant market? Is it a shrinking market? There's all those things that that we're gonna evaluate. All of those are really hard to change. Yep. What can you change? Well, you can change your team. And I, I, I really recommend that, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs want to sell their business and, and retire. And they all say the same thing. You know, I'm willing to go with a new buyer. And well, I like to say, I like to say that, uh, you know, the CEO seller, the day the money hits his bank account is on his boat, either, either, either literally or mentally, one of the two. And, and buyers like myself know this, right? So I think you can do a lot of things in terms of building up your team, bringing in a real CFO, maybe bringing in a strong number two who, who who's willing to go to that number one slot, starting to get your financials audited, all this kind of stuff. You can really start to do a lot of those things. And that's where starting to talk to investment bankers early, way investment bankers, lawyers, accountants, way early before you really engage them on the sale, they can give you advice. They've sold a lot of companies before. They'll say things like this. Once again, you need to listen to them, which is hard, because this is going to cost money. When when we buy a business from entrepreneurs, and almost all the businesses we buy are from founders and families. That's almost everything we do. We are almost always adding to the SGNA in the first year. Yep. And we'll just assume it going into the deal because they have they're still running QuickBooks. They're all this kind of stuff. We're almost always investing in the systems, investing in the team, investing in people. And so as an entrepreneur, the best thing you can do is do some of that stuff up front. When I come in to look at your business, you know, if you're run on QuickBooks, bad. If you're run on Sage, oh, wow, great. This guy's invested in a real accounting system. You know, Sage isn't that expensive, um, but it's going to take some time to implement it. And it's a real accounting system. And I'm going to assume you've then done a bunch of other things as well. So I do think that there's things you can do earlier that won't, because you can't, like if I tell you, hey, businesses with recurring revenue trade for higher multiples, well, I mean, sometimes there's some things you do along the margin there, but that's going to be hard to change. If you're in a low margin distribution business, it just is what it is. So that stuff's hard to change, but there's some things you can change that I focus on that. Got it. Got it. Okay. I'm going to hit on a, on a couple points here um, that yeah. you mentioned, John. This is great. So 
um, <clears throat> in the category of financial readiness, what financial metrics and documentation are crucial for presenting the company in the best light to potential buyers? So, so when we sell a business, we do a financial data book. So yep. Literally, it's this massive Excel file that has like literally everything you'd ever want to know about the company. It has not just the financial statements, but revenue by customer, gross margin by customer, segmented financials. I mean, like, like just this massive file of everything you'd ever want to know, plus a forecast going forward for the next five years with detailed assumptions that I can walk you through why every single one of them is rational and thoughtful. And so that's what buyers ideally are looking for. I've never seen a founder doing the way we would do it, but there's various levels. Some of them have real forecasts. Some of them just like want to send you their audit and say, this is it. Or, or forget the audit. They send you their reviewed financials and say, well, this is it. And 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 look, this, and I've bought lots of businesses with reviewed financials. So I'm not saying you can't do it that way. But the more you prepare, the more of this detail you have, the better off better off for the buyer so i i think that answered your question but it's the, it's the biggest thing you're looking for is this kind of level of sophistication and controls the other thing is going to happen when this auditor comes through and they do an audit they'll tell you all your controls that are bad i'm going to find all that stuff in when i do my due diligence and so if you know it a year ahead of time and you fix some of that stuff then it's not going to come up in due diligence you'll be in better shape got it so hit on that a little bit more how can we optimize our financial statements and reporting to make them more attractive to potential investors? Um, so, so what I would say is, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a bigger question. So um, I have found that many founders do what I call manage by walking around. Yeah. And they started this business, right? They started this business when it was like a million dollars in revenue and there were two customers and two employees or whatever it was, right? So they know every customer, every employee, you know, what have you, right? And so they can literally walk around the office and like smell money being made in Boston. Yep. Because they've been there from the start. Um, financial buyers and other types of buyers, they're gonna want data and reports and all those kinds of things in a level of detail that's way more than you as the person that like built this business, know every customer, know every employee would ever need. But know that that stuff's actually helpful. So it's it's that detailed set of reporting that then builds up into a financial model that I think is what buyers are looking for. And that's where hopefully, you know, um, your investment banker can help you. And, and, and ideally, they'll actually ask for a bunch of stuff. Now, when you say, hey, I don't have it, hey, I don't have it, they'll just say fine and keep going, recognize that that's going to cost you money. So, and, and the biggest thing I think you can do is hire hopefully a CFO type, and it can even be an interim CFO type that has been through this process before. Those folks are, once again, reasonably expensive and not expensive as the third parties who can walk you through it. And, and, and that will be, I think, highly advantageous because they, they may or may not know how to build a detailed data book. They'll at least know the kinds of questions they're asking. And when the investment bankers ask the questions, they'll be better at pulling together the right set of responses and give you a better sense of somebody that's like on your side as opposed to just a third party. Got it. And I know a favorite point, sub point of entrepreneurs and founders is, are there any adjustments or pro forma financials that we should prepare to showcase the company's true earnings potential. I know they love this one and they're thinking of every yeah. granny. A hundred percent. And so yeah. and so there's this whole ad back game where, where <clears throat> you can take various costs that either aren't recurring or a one time or your personal costs and add them back to profitability. And buyers are more than willing to accept that. That gets to having a strong accounting firm that's working with you that can help you walk through this. And that's this kind of quality of earnings, uh, what we call a quality of earnings report that an accountant provides. So what that account will do is take your official audited financials and then create a bunch of ad backs and justifications for those ad backs in a detailed data book. I, I find entrepreneurs don't want to do a quality of earnings. It will cost you money. It's going to cost you easy 50 grand, but oftentimes a lot more. 
just to be clear, I do a quality of earnings in every company I ever sell. Yeah. And I do this for a living. This is a good idea. Because <laughs> once again, then you've had an accounting firm go through and detail all this out. The buyers can then just take their report as opposed to doing it for the first time. They can kind of read through it. And it, it shortens the time frame of the transaction. It makes sure they know more stuff up front. Even if they disagree with some of your ad backs, now you've told them about them in detail. Here's exactly how they're calculated. And here's the data book that goes with it. And so we do it in every deal we do. I highly recommend it to buyers. The other thing is make sure to tell your auditors, hey, we tell them to include every potential adjustment, but detail it and why we made the assumptions. And then as a buyer, if you don't like it, well, I told you exactly how I got here. So you can't then express surprise at the end. Awesome. Awesome. We can talk for hours about operational excellence, you know, market positioning and so on. But sure. so, so one question that always comes up earlier than later, John, is how can we demonstrate the scalability and growth potential of the company's operations? I mean, I, I I think this is often something entrepreneurs struggle with, right? Yep. Because a lot of a lot of times people grow their business to the they grow their business to the size where it's as big as they can kind of manage, and they struggle to get to that kind of next level. And so, all of that scalability stuff is all about: well, do I have a professional CFO? Do I have a real, you know, full test IT system? Do I have a CRM system? Do I have an operational job costing system? All those kinds of things, you know. Most of the time when we buy a business, the entrepreneur is underinvested in IT. Yep. Um, you know, whatever they have works and it's worked for them and they installed it, you know, oftentimes 20 years ago. And, you know, it works and it works the way they run their business. But but a buyer coming in, either strategic or financial, is gonna is gonna think that's not as good. So generally speaking, investments in IT, while they will cost you money are going to get more than a return for buyers. So, you know, we're looking at a, we, we bought a business about three or four years ago from a founder and they had really invested in all this stuff. They had a, you know, it was a, it was a, a, a distributed services business. So they had a, an on job site system. They had Sage already. They had a real C, well, they didn't have a CRM system, but they'd invested in a bunch of this stuff that, we actually paid more for the business because we, we knew it was a more scalable set of systems and people than maybe some of the other things we're seeing. Because awesome. oftentimes we're going to go in and put that stuff in. The awesome. And I found a tactic depending on, you know, the financial acumen of your entrepreneur, John, is to speak in terms of multiples. So whether it was a, a cost rationalization of some sort or it was an investment, this is what it means for you. It means 10x your EBITDA or something, right? 10x that line item. It resonates. Because they get it, they, they they see that a potential you know cost management tactic of some sort can mean you know a million times ten, which is ten million, or it could go the up, up opposite way. You have to spend in terms of developing an accounting function or that latest CRM investment to your point or Sage Intact or whatever. And this is what it means to the value because in many times, John, you pay now or you pay later, right? <laughs> <laughs> and entrepreneurs, you're right. And, and I don't think they understand quite how big the multiple difference can be. Yes. So um, the business we're about to go to market with, we paid six and a half times for, and I will sell it for more than 10 times. Yeah. Some of that is we've really grown it. And so that growth profile helps, but we've put in all these systems. We've put in a world-class team. We've shown them that we can do add-on acquisitions. Like these, th this will yield you real, real increases in valuation, 20, 30, 40% increases for not huge investments. And, and so it, it is important that entrepreneurs understand how big the difference can be. I love that advice, John. Thank you. So in terms of due diligence preparation, what type of diligence process should you, we expect from potential buyers and how can we proactively prepare for it? So the due diligence process is going to be incredibly painful, incredible. I am going to, I or whoever, it will probably will be me, but, but whoever the buyer is, is going to crawl through every detail of your business. They're going to send you detailed data requests. They're going to ask you for like everything. And, and they're going to ask you for like hundreds and hundreds of things that don't make a difference because they don't even know what makes a difference. Right. And so they're just going to ask for literally everything. 
And you you can spend your time arguing with them about what they need. And that takes time and time costs money because, right, your value is going down every day. Or you can just give it all to them in gory levels of detail. So we go build a data site well in advance of selling a business that has everything you could ever want to know about the company in gory levels of detail. And so your accounting firm, your law firm, your investment banker can give you sample data request lists. And it, that that's the six months. That's what it takes to really pull all that kind of stuff together. You, you don't think you need to, you do. And you need to spend the time to pull it all together. Because you're right. Like, why do they need, you know, I don't know, whatever it is. Why do they need every slip and fall accident that's happened for the last five years? They probably don't really need it, but they're going to ask for it. And if you just have it and you give it to them, then you can move on. And so the the level of detail they're going to go into, and and they don't, they don't know, you know, they're trying to find that hidden thing you haven't told them and they don't know what it is. So they're going to ask you for a million things. We, you know, your your advisor should help you get prepared for that, but recognize it's gonna take six to twelve months and recognize that that's why you're gonna invest in a real CFO. We can go deal with that for six months. Cause I get it, you don't want to deal with that. And you know, the best the best processes are when they've hired someone to go figure this out like 12 months ahead of time and they've paid that person a fair amount of money and, and then they're prepared. Because otherwise it's always, well, the CEO is trying to pull it out of here. I mean, that, that never works for me. Awesome, John. Awesome. Great advice. Thank you. So um, again, in my travels, um, I'd like your outside in perspective. And this is really about the key financial drivers. I've had, you know, experience with, you know, delusional entrepreneurs and great ones who really understand the financial performance of the business and over a, a number of years, what it means. And so my question is really, John, around kind of like the street view and looking in from the outside in, right? What are the key financial trends and drivers that can enhance the sell value of a company? What do they need to look for? Everyone thinks their company's great. Right, they could be losing yeah, money. Yeah, no, no, that's right. Red that's right. They think it's great and it's worth billions of dollars, right? But truly, the street looks at it a certain way, and there's certain things that they should demonstrate in order to maximize values. What are a few of those? So, I think the biggest thing that we're looking for that entrepreneurs don't understand is we are really, we are really trying to understand sort of the demand, it's, it's all about the top line. We're really trying to understand the demand drive. There's two things, the demand drivers to the business. So what market are you in and what's going to drive that market? So, you know, worst would be like steel, right? So if you're selling steel, the price of steel does this all the time. The volume does this, the price does it even worse. It's a really non-recurring business. And by the way, most steel goes into construction and construction happens one time. So steel, like, so, so that, that would be like the worst case. The best case you hear about all the time is SaaS software, right? So, you know, they sign up for it. They need it once they've signed up for it. They're almost never going to be able to get rid of it. And so it's super stable, steady in. So I'd say the first thing we're looking for is like, how stable is your business? And we're going to understand the demand drivers in the industry. We're going to understand how recurring is your revenue. Do you get exactly the same revenue from the same customers every year? That's a good fact. Each customer doing that's a bad fact. We're going to say, how concentrated are your top customers? A lot of smaller customers is way better than a couple of big ones. And so I'd say that's the biggest thing we're going to start with, right? Like, what's going to happen to the top line of this business going forward? The best case is I can grow it. But what I really want to make sure is that it doesn't all of a sudden I don't decline. And so it's the it's it's growth is great, but stability is almost as important as growth. And it's yeah. Okay. And what about other parts of the um of you know financial performance, profit margins, EBITDA, free cash flow, so on? Tell us a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so let's go through them each. So then I'm gonna to want yeah. to understand your gross margin. Yes. Uh, and in particular, understand how stable is it and will and how will underlying moves in commodities and pricing end up impacting it? And how much can you pass through those increases or not and how quickly? So, 
you what they want to see is either a there aren't a lot of commodities in your business or b if you have them they're easy to pass through very quickly to customers so that your margins don't don't do this all the time. critically important on that kind of gross margin then you have um then you have uh the sgna usually that's very manageable if there's one thing entrepreneurs manage well at SGNA. The key question uh, buyers ask there is if you underinvest in an SGNA, then I'm going to have to go reinvest in. And so you're going to think, well, you know, I squeezed my SGNA, so I, you know, I'm a, I'm a half a million dollars more profitable. A buyer like me is just going to add that back, knowing I'm going to need that level of SGNA, and and it, and it actually is going to get you. Anyway. Um, so that's the second thing. So that gets you down to kind of like the EBITDA level. But then also the other thing we're going to look at is the asset intensity of your business, the capex in your business, and the networking capital. Yes. How asset intense is your business? There's a couple of reasons I want to look at that. Capex because it literally takes away from cash flow. So I care about the cash flow of your business every year, and I care about what the ongoing capex is. So capex gets split into growth versus maintenance. So maintenance capex is hey I have to spend this amount of money every year just to keep operating. Growth is, hey, I'm growing, so I need to buy more capital equipment to grow. That's not necessarily so. Obviously, growth, I mean, growth capex, all capex is bad. Maintenance capex is worse. Yes. <laughs> growth yeah. capex isn't quite as bad. And then networking capital is the other part of, of, of kind of growth capex, right? If if I have you know 30 days of networking capital, every time I grow, I actually put more working capital in the business. So a less working capital intense business grows with less capital attached to it. So buyers are going to be very focused on your capital intensity. And there are actually things you can do to manage it. So I know you like to pay everyone the day you owe it to them, but you can stretch everyone for 10 or 15 days. And they won't even call you. Like they're expecting it. You've just never done it. Um, you can call your customers and when they're slower, yell at them and do things to get them to pay you quicker. When I buy an entrepreneur on business, I almost always immediately stretch payables and start to work on collecting receivables. And I almost always get a capex because we're just disciplined about it. And so that's another thing that if you go hire a good CFO, they can go do. And, and if you have to do that enough ahead of time, but if you do, I mean, that's just cash in your pocket, plus you're a less capital intense business when you go to sell and your business will be worth more. Got it. So I'm hearing, John, you know, revenue growth, a consistent trend of revenue growth, uh, profit margins, gross profit being the first bus stop, and then EBITDA margins, both in margin efficiency as well as dollars, right? Percentages as well as dollars. Free okay. cash flow, which encompasses the, the uh, you know, the CapEx uh, component of that. Um, how important is, is your analysis relative to the competition? Each of these kind of fundamentals here versus the competition in the industry. How important? Give, give a perspective of how you look at this now. It, it sort of all depends, right? So um, it all it, it, it actually really depends on the buyer and how they think about it, right? There's some buyers that are looking to buy pristine businesses that are growing quickly that, you know, have industry best margins because they think they can buy that and use that kind of platform to grow. There's other buyers that, hey, if your margins are lower than the industry, they're going to think, great, I can buy and improve those. That's the way I can make money on the deal. But broadly speaking, yeah, they're looking for better businesses that are growing quickly that they can, you know, they'd rather buy a better business with better kind of margins. And so, you know, it is important to have a sense of kind of where you sit in a competitive set, where your competitors are. And, and, and buyers of your business, in many cases, will know. You know, if you have a an, an HVAC repair business, I know what those things should make. I've seen probably 20 of them in the last year, Yeah. right? And so I'll have a very good sense of where you should be from a profitability perspective. And if you're hiring the right investment banker, they'll know too. And that's where it gets to hiring the right person that can run help. Got it. How important is the level of debt in the business for your analysis? Um, I'm going to buy it on a cash-free, debt-free basis. So I actually don't care whether you have debt in your business or not. Um, it doesn't matter to me even a little bit. How much working capital you have in your business matters. But how yeah. much debt is, I just don't care. Got it. Understood. Okay. And then, you know, in preparation, uh, John, for this, you know, T minus 36 or T minus 24, 
and entrepreneurs really have to understand is the need for strong financial controls. You know, well-maintained records, robust internal controls, you know, adherence to accounting standards. Tell us a little bit more about how you look at that and let's encourage the entrepreneurs and the founders all the way to boards, the importance of this, especially well, well, in the it, process. Yeah, I agree. And I, but I think it, it, it starts with, hey, you know, when it was just your business, this didn't matter at all, right? Like, I mean, I get it, you know, when it was just your business and your money, like why spend money to count it and whether you're gap or not, like who cares, right? Because it's just how much money I do at the end of the year in the bank. And so you're right, you know, and, and by the way, I don't need the financials to manage the business. I do that by walking around. I know the people, I know the customers, I know the margins, and like all that is useless. So yeah, for the last 20 years of your business, getting an audit would have been silly. Why would you want to do that? When you're going to go to sell the business, all of those controls matter and they matter a lot. And so, you know, and they're going to make the process go smoother and make all of that really matter. And so, yes, they start to matter a lot and they're going to really drive what people are willing to pay for your business. And, and, but it's important to start with, I get why you didn't do it before. And that was a smart thing to do, but now the smart thing to do is actually to invest in. Um, it doesn't have to be a huge amount of money, but yes, getting off QuickBooks is a smart thing to do. Yes. I, I know, I know your bookkeeper that you've had for 20 years is great. And she was probably great for what you needed. But yes, if you go hire a CFO, I guarantee you that person will be worth every penny. And, and, and does that make a difference necessarily, John, that you've seen preparedness in financials, preparedness in accounting systems, maybe hire a, a CFO? How would you estimate that changes the turn, the valuation turn? Have you seen that make a big difference? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. It could be like 10, 20, 30 percent. Like it could be a wow. lot. The wow. thing you got to realize, like most, so I, I run a firm that buys just founder-owned business. Yes. We are very used to QuickBooks, no CFO, total mess. I mean, like that's just what we did. And so we also don't pay huge prices for businesses because there are limited numbers of people that are willing to do that. And we have a whole operations team that we can drop in day one that can start help pulling all this in place. The typical private equity firm wants to buy something that's ready to go. And they're working with lenders that are assuming you have all of this stuff ready to go. And so if you have your financial house in order, you significantly broaden the number of people that can look at buying your business. And you're going to get a significantly higher price. And even if I'm buying it, I'm willing to pay more for that because I have less work I have to do. I'm willing to do the work I have to, but I have less work I have to do. Got it. Got it. So I've got a quick round question because I've had entrepreneurs yes. who, who have said, who have said to me, John, I prefer market share than bottom line. And I've had others who said, you know what? I'll give up market share in top line if my profitability is better. Comment on that. So, so, um, like, so, so there are a lot of people in Silicon Valley that have made a ton of money Yes. By almost totally ignoring profitability and just driving top line. Yes. So, you know, who, far be it for me to tell, you know, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, they don't know what they're doing. Because clearly they do, and they've made a lot more money than I have. <laughs> so I, I think there are, and, and in the whole VC land, I mean, that's that's the way they work, right? And so, yes, there's this whole world out there that doesn't, that doesn't care about, you know, doesn't care about the bottom line. It's just trying to drive top line and market share and that stuff. For, for most founders and most entrepreneurs that are running businesses that they're going to try to sell, you know, more, I'm going to pay you a multiple of your EBITDA. And so the more money you make, the more money it's worth. And, and that's just a fact. And so, you know, it is almost always, you know, so growth for the growth, it, it, growth that isn't profitable is not a good thing for 90% of most businesses out there. Um, once again, there's, there's, there's Tesla and Amazon and like lots of folks have, in, in the Valley do this differently, but if you're not a Valley back SaaS software startup and you're running a, a more typical middle market business, you know, unprofitable growth is not a good idea. Now, you know, occasionally we'll, you know, if you're trying to get into a new market or you're trying to get a new customer, do we take lower margin work? Do we even take work at, at no more. I mean, everyone makes those business decisions sometimes, 
And if they're thoughtful, you know, and they're like, hey, I'm going to do this the first time, knowing that I want to prove myself. And people do that for my business, right? I mean, all sorts of folks will do that and try to win my business going forward. So I get that as a business strategy. There's nothing wrong with it. As long as it's a one-off because I'm going to win profitable business, not just growth at the expense of profit. Got it. And that's true for 90% of businesses and almost all businesses that aren't backed by real VCs. Understood. Awesome. Awesome. And so, you know, John, we can also get, we can also lose the forest through the trees. And at the end of all this, summarizing this entire process, it's important that we present a clear and coherent narrative about the business. All right. Because, you know, we can get lost in the mud. All right. But really to be able to express the story to prospective buyers is critically important, right? Equally important as all this stuff. Tell me some more about your, you know, your experience in that one. So, um, so what I would say here is that like the biggest mistake I see entrepreneurs making is my business is everything. We're great. Like we can do this and we can do that and we can do the other. And, you know, it's like, they want to say, oh, the, the total addressable market is huge. You can grow this thing to the moon. And 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 and, and like that doesn't go over real well. What goes over real well is, hey, what we're really good at is, you know, this very specific product in this very specific segment, and we are the best at that. And then we're growing into some of these other things. But this is the core of our business. This is where we're growing into. And, and that's what you actually want to see. So um, having a really good idea of who you are and having a really good idea of what your real customer value proposition is. Um, you know, I, I hear entrepreneurs tell me things all the time that I know aren't true. And so the best people, one, they have a very focused business and they know what it is. And two, they have a really clear articulation of why they're better than the company. Yes. It's really well done. So, so we, we own a business that's in the um, that installs fire protection systems for what it's worth, and and they're really strong in multifamily apartments. And when we were meeting them, they said, "Look, the reason why we're so good is because most commercial industrial applications use metal pipe, and in a multifamily apartment building, you use plastic pipe." And you wouldn't think those are very different. Actually, conceptually, they don't have to be. But the kind of people that like to work with plastic pipe and metal pipe turns out to be two totally separate businesses. So this is what we're really good at. And it's super defensible. And let me tell you all about it. That was really compelling, actually, right? They can do metal pipe, too. But they're really strong at this kind of stuff. So that kind of story is actually, I think, what gets buyers more excited that, oh, we can do fire protection, we can do commercial, we can do residential, we can do, we can do, we can do. And hey, I know we're really only Atlanta today, but we can do Florida, we can do Atlanta. We, no, 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 no. It's better to, and, and then these guys could tell you very clearly exactly why they were better than the competition. Because our guys are highly skilled in using this plastic pipe. They like it, they use it all the time. We have done more installations in multifamily apartment buildings in Georgia than anyone else times three. We know the whole process that it was like really compelling. And so, um, and, and my guess is most entrepreneurs know that, like they know actually why they win business. Um, but, but they give me this, this kind of fluffy sale and say they can do everything. So the more specific they can be and the more real they can be and Hey, this is, this is what we really do to win business. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and the more, and, and the more, yeah, the, the more less fluffy and the more real world they can be, the better. So I've been in businesses, John, as well, where we've hired consultants to, um, you know, establish a vision statement and a mission statement and all that stuff in preparation for the sale. But your point is much more, much more finite. And I 150% agree, John, you know, the well, closer you get, I'm a big believer in mission statements and vision statements too, by the way. So yes, yes, we buy way. every business, we make them have a mission statement. 100%. Values, you can see our Hidden Harbor values behind me. Um, so we we do that. That stuff is good. It's a really good way to communicate with your employees. You know, most entrepreneurs never do that because, I mean, it wasn't necessary. They're talking all the time. So it's a good thing to do. But you're right. 
what they really need to do is understand like what's our target market, who's our competition, and why do we win? If you can answer those three questions, and and like maybe a, maybe a consultant can help you ask those the right way, but that consultant is going to have the answer you need to have. Beautiful, well done. I love that. That's a lovely, lovely way of putting that. John, thank you. So you led into the, the question, was there anything else? Because one of the questions was, what is the biggest mistake that you've seen companies make in preparing for a sale? You talked about, you know, hyper-focused on the statement and how they're different and how they make money and so on. Was there any other big mistakes that you could share for our audience um, that companies make in preparing for a sale? I mean, the big mistake is not getting all your dirty laundry out up front and not really being prepared and hiring the right advisor. I mean, those are the two, those are the two that that, that I see really get deep. Um, and if you do those two things, you're probably going to be in reasonably good shape. Um, and the only, you know, the only part of that is hire the advisors early and actually listen to them. So, right, I mean, there's, there's, you know, and, and recognize just how long this takes. So as an example, um, the business that we're like literally in the market with this week, we started working on the sale process six months ago and we won't sell the business. We're hoping to get it sold this this calendar year. I have a business I'm looking to sell next June and I'm starting to work on right now. That gives you that this is going to take a lot of time and a lot of energy and, and it's going to be super frustrating, but preparation really matters. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we've gone, you started off with that and we've come right back to that. So what is your parting advice for businesses looking to sell in two years, 18 months and a year? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 start talking to people early, start getting the best advice, find the right advisors, people that you trust, but they but they need to be people that are really heavily experienced in doing this. So, once again, your lawyer, who I know, you know, negotiated your lease for you and a couple other things, and who sold two companies in their life, is is a wonderful person, but is not going to be the right person to advise you on selling your business. It may even be that that accounting firm that's kind of reviewed your financials and filed your taxes isn't going to be full test enough to really help you in the sale process. There's a lot, you know, and and and, and then you got to find the right investment banker, but your lawyer and accounting firm can help you find those people. So once again, start early, talk to lots of people. There's lots of people that are, that are out there to help you. Find some folks you trust, really listen to them. And um, and then just be prepared for what's going to be a, a tough process. It, it's it's frustrating. It's hard. I mean, we couldn't be more prepared, and it's frustrating, long and hard for us. So it's going to be a long, hard, frustrating process for you. But at the end of the day, it is something you can get done if you if you prepare for it the right way. Awesome, John. This has been fantastic. I've learned a lot from you. This has been superb. <laughs> you you you've you put PE and investment banking in a box. So this is in, in a very short space of time. So thank you very much, John. This is Perfect. just a superb session. You're, you're just a wonderful, your wisdom bites and expertise have been superb. I know you're busy, you've got a process going on right now in a cell. Thank you for your time, John. This has been superb. I really appreciate it. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Awesome.